Welcome to Beyond the Pod, presented by SodaStick.com. Brunette, he moves, Brunette back in, he scores! Minnesota has upset the Colorado Avalanche! Andrew Brunette, the game-winning goal! Here are your hosts, the second greatest scorer in Gopher hockey history, Pat Micheletti. And the second greatest hockey analyst on this podcast, Brandon Molesky. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Pod. I'm Brandon Molesky. My co-host is Pat Micheletti, former Golden Gopher great. Beyond the Pod, as always, brought to you by SodaStick.com. Pat, we're uh, kind of in the dead zone for free agency. Not a ton, a, lot, a ton going on, but I think for the Minnesota Wild, there is, which is why, of course, we had to bring in the best when it comes to insight with the Minnesota Wild from The Athletic, Michael Russo. Michael, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I really have no idea where to begin with you because there's just a bunch of directions we could go. So I'm just going to give you an overall general question. You know, when the, when the Minnesota Wild at the beginning of this offseason kind of plotted out what they wanted to do throughout the offseason, uh, how much of this is going the way they had planned? Well, first of all, I'm so impressed with how professional this show is. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you're like a, a director, a producer, a graphics yeah. guy. Like, why, why are there like 25, 30, 40 people in a, in a Fox Sports North truck when, you know, you could just hire Brandon to just hit all these buttons and boom. I, I would concur. I, I didn't do the graphics. I, I, would, I would concur because I would be completely lost. Yeah. I just loved how it went from the graphic to Brandon, then he knew how to edit you in. Like, yep. And then all of a sudden it became a three shot. Like he's, he could do it all. Yeah. It's just pretty impressive. Yeah. No. Russo, do you want to talk to my bosses after the show's done? Yeah, please? exactly. I'd, I'd appreciate yeah. it. I'm going to get you a job at the Ballet's truck next year. So. <laughs> I would love it. Yeah. Um, so what was what was your that, That's what I studied in college, television. Now, I was just saying, when the Minnesota Wild, at the beginning of the offseason, had kind of a, a blueprint of, hey, how we want this offseason to transpire, how much of that has gone the way they expected? Um, I don't think it went ex- as expected with their third defense pair. Um, and it, obviously they expected to get Felino, and unfortunately one led to the other, right? Because right. They, because they did the way that I am reading this completely right now is that they lost out on no forwards, but Felino, which means that they tied themselves to Felino that day. So they tied themselves to two players. They wanted to go get Goligoski and they wanted to go get Nick Felino. And then their hope was to go sign Zach Bogosian on the right side of the third pair to compete mm. with Kalen Addison and then bring back Ian Cole. What happened was, is now they talked to guys like Jake McCabe. Um, you know, he was really the only other defenseman that I know for a fact that they went hard after. But once it went to four times four for him, they yeah. just weren't, they couldn't go that way. Yeah, okay. much. So then what happened is really, if you think about it, the only guys they lost out on were Cole and Bogosian. Bogosian went with the three-year term with the Stanley Cup champion. You totally understand that. Yeah. Um, and then what happened was they waited so long on Nick. By that time, Ian Cole had signed one year at 2.9 in Carolina. There's no doubt that I bet you if the Wild offered him a one- or a two-year deal around the same money or even maybe a little less, he would have been back here. But Nick, but but Ian – all of a sudden, his job started to dissipate that day. And so he just, I think, panicked and signed with Carolina, which, again, I don't mind. He's going to a great team that's a Stanley Cup contender as well. Uh, but then what happened is then they were left scrambling for their third deep pair. So, you know, Nick Felino sort of created a domino effect. And then, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot left, right? I mean, they went after Hawk and Pa. He wanted a three-year term with a bunch of Finns in Dallas. He went there. Um, the Wild, I don't think, wanted to go three. The way I read it is the Wild offered, you know, deals to a number of, th- third, you know, potential third pair defensemen, guys like Ryan Murray, Kulikov, and maybe a couple others. I think Kulikov pulled the trigger first. And at that point, then they needed a second one. I think that Hockenpah was the guy they were going after. He signed with, uh, with, um, with uh, uh, Dallas. And then I think they had a ch- sort of a choice between Vatnin and Merrill, and I think Merrill pulled the trigger. I don't know if they officially made an offer to Vatnin, but I, uh, I, from what my understanding was, they at least liked him, and they were looking at him. The next thing I know, when I thought they were going after Vatnin, it came across our desk that they signed John Merrill. So, you know, did it go as as according to plan? Probably not. Um, but really, when it come down to it, they lost out on Nick Foligno, which to me opens the door for Matt Boldy or Marco Rossi, which I, uh, you know, in a lot of ways intrigues me. Yeah. And it did it did affect the third D pair, which absolutely could play a big pivotal role in the way that this team trans this season transpires if Kulikov, 
and Merrill either aren't good enough or, you know, it forces Dean Evison to overplay his top four, which I think we're going to see a ton of. This could, you know, the one thing about the Wild in the past, and I know I'm rambling, is that they tried to even out their really, their, de- their, their you know, it wasn't your traditional third D pair that played 10 minutes a night, right? Yeah. They usually played a regular shift. Right. And now who knows if you're going to have a Kulikov Addison, a Kulikov Merrill, if you're going to be able to play them more than 10, 12, 14 minutes. We'll see. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Um, we'll see, but it, it's certainly from the outset, I mean, looking at our, our analytics guy at the athletic today, Dom, um, the model shows that the wild are not going to be as good next year. We'll see. Hey, I, I want to go back um, to the expansion draft if we can for a second. I've always wondered this. Now we don't see a lot of expansion drafts, obviously, but have you ever spoken to a guy, a pro, you know, we'll call it a prominent player who was left unprotected and get their thoughts on how they feel about that. If they feel like they're going to get moved, uh, if they feel like they're not wanted, you know, what, you know, I've always been curious, you know, um, how a guy feels left unprotected. Yeah. Well, when I talked to, uh, in the 2017 one, it was a little deceiving because yes. Dumbo was un- Dumbo was unprotected, but he was protected. Eric Stahl was unprotected, but he was protected. So we really never had to ask those questions because we knew they had this deal in place. This one here, um, you know, Carson Soucy, I think, figured all along that he was 100% going to be unprotected. At the end there, you start to wonder, well, would they maybe leave Dumbo unprotected, protect Soucy, and then the worst kind of Worst comes to worst, he just freed $6 million of cap space in Matt Dumba for a guy that's obviously not been tradable here the last couple of years because they haven't been able to pull the trigger. And a guy that, frankly, might have to be traded in the next year and a half, two years, because I don't know how the Wild are going to re- be able to afford him at this stage um, with two years left on his deal at $6 million. So there's a part of me that wondered um, – if that would happen. The reason why I was smiling, Pat, by the way, when you asked that question is so um, our Winnipeg writer, um, I'm, I'm sort of like the, uh, you know, the father figure for a lot of our young writers. Yeah. Yesterday he was, ta- he was, he sent me a slack on our internal messaging system asking me like he was talking to uh, Dylan DeMello, Dylan DeMello, right? Is yep. it Dylan? Um, DeMello yesterday about that very topic. And he wanted to get some tips on how he would broach this story with him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it was funny. He asked this. Unfortunately, I didn't see it until after he talked to DeMello. But I was thinking about it. Like, I've never actually had that conversation with any wild player because to me, you know, it was obvious. You know, Nico Sturm would have been the one guy. But then when the wild obviously uh, bought out Parisi, and then it made it made Bukes and Rass the obviously obvious two guys that they were going to expose. So uh, you know, I don't I, I don't think Nick Bukes did expect it to be exposed. So I haven't really asked that question. Yeah. But you know, it, you know, Pat, it's always been a common thing in the NHL of when you're on an expansion team, you always the way you, the rallying cry inside that room is we were the outcasts, we were the right, guys that they, right. you weren't wanted, and Vegas really embraced that, and that's in large part why they were so good. I remember, you know, in in 2017. Um, I covered a lot of the, the playoff run um, when they went to the Stanley Cup final. Yeah. And I'm telling you, like, that was a huge part. Whenever we talked to guys like Ryan Reeves and Marsha So and Riley Smith and those guys, even Alex Tuck, you know, it was always uh, we were we were the guys that nobody wanted. And it really became a big topic in that in that locker room. By the way, Michael, at, at some point. Not today, because there's enough to talk about. At some point, I'd love to have a conversation with you, maybe maybe actually on the air on KFN about your job as a reporter because I, I find it fascinating i've seen so many beat writers that struggle to get connections and struggle to break news and have the sources you do and i would i would love a, like a tutorial on how you've gotten to the point where you are now but we'll save that for another day yeah. um and i know you're not the buffalo and I, and, I, and I do love talking about myself so it's perfect. <laughs> I, i'm no. well aware of that yeah <laughs> Uh, I actually, I, you know, it is funny. Like the, the one thing I do, like I met with a kid the other day at a Starbucks here. Like I actually, uh, that's the type of stuff, like, you know, I actually enjoy talking about because, you know, like when you get old, like myself and you've done this job a long time, you sort of, you know, you, you kind of want to set a little uh, template for like the new young reporters that are coming into sports writing and the way that they could do this job and sort of help them out when you start to see the, the, you know, the finish line of your career as opposed to the the starting. And, you know, there's a lot of cool stories and, and ways that you do this job that I do it very differently than probably a lot of people. Uh, so I know you're not the Buffalo Sabres beat writer, so I don't know how much you have information you have from the Buffalo side, but I'm kind of fascinated because Eichel clearly wants out. Um, is Buffalo, do you think that they're feeling pressure to trade him 
this off season or could it go into next year? And, and I asked that because I'm just wondering, are they steadfast on their current price or could you see them dropping at some point to where maybe the wild get back in the mix? I mean, it's a great question. I had John Vogel, our athletic Buffalo Sabres writer, actually when I filled in for common the other day, Brandon, and he, you know, I asked him that very question and he does think that they're going to either have to have the price come down or they're going to have to start uh, coming up a way to retain salary here because it's going to be a lot easier, even from a Minnesota wild perspective to stomach, trading for a $7 million Jack Eichel, a $6.5 million Jack Eichel, then a $10 million Jack Eichel. Yeah. The yeah. Wild, without giving up almost $10 million in players, cannot acquire Jack Eichel. Now, if it was a $7 million Jack Eichel, would you be willing to trade a Fiala for him in that package? Probably. Yeah. Um, the one, you know, I think rudimentary error that I, I think the Wild have made here is bringing Fiala to arbitration because now to me, you've really, if you don't before that arbitration hearing, which by the way, if you don't mind, I just wanted to just check my email because today was the day that we're going <laughs> to, we're just going to, I was about to get an email. No, nope, it's not here yet. Uh, I was about to get an email. Uh, hopefully I didn't take away the uh, video. Um, I was no, that would have been, that been, been great to have live breaking news breaking on a tape, yeah, on a tape right. podcast. We'll, we'll see it. I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll just double check, but um, yeah, no, no email yet. Uh, I'm uh, we're gonna find out hopefully in a li very little bit, maybe during this podcast, what date uh, his hearing is. But if I were the Wild, I'd I'd sign the guy. If you are intent on potentially trading Kevin Fiala, you know you've got to sign him to a extension. And the reason why I'm not saying you know use and abuse Kevin Fiala here, but like if you want to put him in a in a Jack Eichel package. And Kevin Fiala in arbitration chooses a one or two year award. He's a diminished trade asset. Is but he? if you sign it, if you, yeah, because like yes. Buffalo Sabres know that he's not going to sign them for nothing. There. Yeah. 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 Unless, yeah. unless, yeah. unless Buffalo, maybe, yeah. Yeah. unless maybe, yeah. unless maybe, you know, if Kevin Fiala is going to say, you know what, they're going to pay me seven and a half, eight million, maybe then they do it. But, um, but, yeah. but to me, if you sign him to six times six, then you could trade him. You know, you know, in that type yeah. of deal, because then Buffalo knows they have him for six years. So like so fans understand the reason why the Wild have not been able to do this is because Buffalo wants all futures because they know that nobody wants to play there. They right. don't want like Jack Eichel works for the Wild over a Mika Zibanejad or an Elias Pettersson that because he's signed for five years at 10 million. So you if you trade money for money, you know that you could afford them. But you can't just go out and sign Mika Zibanejad next year. Or you, like the fans were like, well, if they're going after Eichel, why don't they go after Landeskog? Well, the reason why is because in, in the Eichel deal, they were giving up players to make that. They can't just go out and sign a guy to eight really, times yeah, nine. Right. So, um, so from Buffalo's standpoint is that they are having – they're in a rebuild. They can't get guys to go there. We just saw their free agent pickups, and it was just – you know, they don't have a goal. You know, yeah. And so, um, so like, you know, to me, like, I think their big thing is, is that they want guys that they are going to have under team control for seven years, which is Rossi Boldy, a first round pick that's imaginary, um, you know, maybe a, a young guy like a Greenway or something like that, that they would take that money back. But, but I just think that that's why it's happening. So back to your original question, Brandon, in terms of pressure, I don't think they should feel pressure. Like if I was Kevin Adams at this point and you're, you've been completely stubborn, and saying, like, this is our price, which is his absolute right. I mean, this is a top 10 center in the NHL if he's healthy. Um, then that's his right. So what I think he should do is let the guy have his surgery. Then Jack Eichel needs to be mature, have the surgery, rehab there, come back, be the freaking best Jack Eichel you could be. And then next summer or this season, they revisit this and trade the guy. Um mm -hmm. And, and then you say to the Minnesota Wild, sorry, Jack Eichel's a superstar again. This is the price. This is yeah, what you got to pay. Right. Anaheim, this is the price. Vegas, this is the price. Montreal, whatever. And um, so, like, to me, um, sorry, you never <laughs> – when you get a text from a source, you do just got to check it. Is, it, sure is it the Eichel stuff. trade? Is he going to the Wild? Can you break that uh, right now? No, uh, nothing. Uh, so, um, so, you know, uh, so, you know that, that's sort of my point is that – if I was Buffalo, I would not lower the price right now. I would say we we have such faith in this guy that we're gonna that we're gonna let him rehab here, play well here, and then trade him. What what's the pressure point? Just because he doesn't want to come back? Yeah, you know, like there really is none. He's under control for five years. 
The one, the one thing is this will get uglier because if he comes back, you've got to take the C off his chest. You can't have right. a captain that hates your organization yeah. and has been so public about it. So yeah. like that, that's another issue uh, that is going to come up if they don't trade him. But if I was Billy Guerin at this point, I would keep my foot in the sand, say this is what we're willing to pay, and 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 that's it. And if I was Buffalo, I'd say this is what we want. And if that's not good enough, then they got to wait. Um, and that's what I would do. But we'll see. I've had my phone on me at my hip while I'm sleeping for the last two weeks. So uh, I, the Wild, even though they, uh, I'm told by sources, are completely out of this right now, if the price comes down, they're going to be back in it. They want yeah. the guy. You know, there's no doubt about it. Um, like when you were reading Scott Burnside's story when he was embedded with the Wild, and yeah. they were, you know, they were legitimately workshopping an Eichel trade on the day of the draft. Mm-hmm. You just know that the Wild are in it. And that was the day, by the way. No, sorry. he, he Sorry, I'm, get, I'm getting it mixed four. up. Yeah. When I reported, it was about a week later that they were out. Um, but, um, but you know, if, they, if the price comes down, they're going to be back in. They want them. If it were for me, I don't know if I'd have the guts. I'd want – if I were Billy Guerin, I would not let – I would not make the trade with him without him having the surgery. Like, to me – I actually think it's incumbent on Billy Guerin to not give up a haul for uh, injured Jack Eichel. Like Buffalo should have the risk, have the surgery there, rehab, see if he's the same Jack Eichel, and then you make the trade then. But why give up a haul? Like why give up asset after asset after asset for Jack Eichel? Then he has a surgery, and now we're not even going to see him until probably November. You know, um, you know, I I just don't know why that makes sense. Let's look at this current team, this current roster. Um, and you know, every team goes into a season thinking, you know what, we got a chance, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, you have, let's say every coach does, every player does because they compete and they want to do the best they can. Um, do you think Billy Guerin, you know, and he's gonna, he's gonna tell you, I like my team, you know, we're going to compete, you know, we got a good core, blah, blah, blah. But do you think he knows that, you know what? We're not there yet. You know, we don't need to go out and even though we know that they don't have a lot of money, Mm -hmm. um, but we can't really, you know, go for that home run yet. Yeah. I mean, you're right. I mean, once he, once he, you know, look, once the, and, and again, as I wrote the other day, the wild would be in this position if they had Parisian suitor, right. Probably actually a little worse because they would have, you know, 7.538 times two, locked into these guys for the next four years. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is going to be the Wild's life for the next four years, and Wild fans yeah. have to get used to it. I mean, it's just that simple. They cannot go out and sign any big free agent to a long-term yeah. contract. This is going to be one- and two-year deal offers for a while, and that automatically takes you out of things, which is why, again, like to me, I would not have had the guts to buy out Ryan Suter. I would have been much more communicative with Ryan Suter and tried to work out a thing with him that said, look, I don't want you here. You got to almost tell him that. Yeah. And I think Ryan Suter, if he's like, holy crap, this GM doesn't want me here. I think he would say, all right, you know what? Or I'll waive my new move. I don't want to be on a team for the next four years that doesn't want me. Like, I, I just think that's the one error that I think Billy made is that I think he just dropped the hat, dropped the, this, you know, the, the boulder on, on Ryan Suter without ever talking to him. And I just don't know if that was the right decision, but, but look, that's the way that Billy did it. Um, yeah. You know, um, th- and but to get back to your original question, like I, I, I don't know how you could look at this team and say they're as good as Colorado, Winnipeg, and some no, of these right, Vegas and, right, the, and these other right. teams. So, like again, that's why if I, if I was the Wild right now, I don't sign Thomas Tatar at one year times two. I don't, you know, like I don't like at this point, this is your team. Like unless I can make a trade to make it better. I think you open the door for Connor Dewar, Brandon yeah. Duhame, Marco Rossi, um, Matt Boldy to make this team. Well, let's, it, let's it, see it, a guy it, play in this team. Like Matt Boldy, you can't tell me that Matt Boldy can't play right now on that line with Ryan Hartman and Kevin Fiala and perform. And even if right. he does, he's not Matt, the Matt Boldy that we're going to see at the end of the year, at least it gives him the, the ability to play in the show and get a taste. Because if this team isn't a cup contender, what's the crime – of putting him in and have him learn on the show. Other teams do it that way. And and so that's that's what I would do. Yeah. They've already burned the year. Um, I guess the only risk there is what if Matt Boldy does erupt, is a Calder contender. Then next year is another great player. And now you've got now you've put yourself in this position where you're like, holy crap, now they gotta assign him. Because yeah. part of the you know, one thing that 
There are a couple <laughs> of things that really made this offseason really challenging. Is once they signed Jaron Spurgeon to the seven year extension with the no move, and then they made the same decision with Jonas Brodin right. with six million in the no move. The fact that they didn't trade Dumba put this team in this position. And then the other thing was they they play in this um there are two actually parts to this. They play in this in my eyes, crummy division against four teams that were just atrocious defensively that allowed Erickson Eck and Kaprizov to have these monster years. And then what happened is there's no way that the Wild ever thought that they were going to give Karel Kaprizov an eight-year deal at 525. They had to be penciling him as a $3 million player in his new deal at the beginning of last season. Well, he has an absolute monster season, so you got to pay him. And then Kaprizov shows up and is just absolutely unbelievable. And now he's a guy that's an eight or nine million dollar player. And Fiala thinks he's a seven and a half, eight million dollar yeah. So the Wild also had, you know, the pandemic has forced this really awkward season with very few fans, crummy teams in your division. And it allowed these guys, and every team has crummy teams. But the point is, is that they weren't playing through a 31 team circuit. Right. They were playing through a right. seven. Right. And then what happened is these guys are now getting overpaid, not overpaid, but they're getting way above the market value that the wild projected. So now, you know, wh what if that, you know, what if that happened with Boldy? So that would be the only thing that I could think that they could be really worried about putting Boldy on the team. But to me, you shouldn't, you shouldn't force the player into a pigeonhole. If, if he has, yeah. if he turns out to be a great player and he has a monster year and you've decided to burn that year and now you got to resign him in two years to this crazy contract, then you got to, you know, you just figure, right, we're letting Dumba go. That's six million to free up. Victor Rask will be off the team by then. Uh, maybe Jordan Greenway is going to be traded by then. And and so, you know, you keep on cycling it out. But um, I think I, I if it were me, if Boldy comes to camp and impresses, I think he should be on this team. But yeah. if not, uh, like I personally think Rossi, Rossi should start in Iowa. But if not, I want to see Duham or Dewar on this team. I don't want to see some – 32 year old yeah. just block out a Connor Dewar, Brandon Duham, because this is now the time the wild need to start cycling in these entry level guys. Well, here's, here's, and, and although and, Duham is no longer an entry level yeah. guy. Okay. So here's my thinking of what I think they're thinking. And you can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I think they are, they know where they're at. That's why they made the moves with Parisian suitor. I think that, that, they're relying on their, their their core pieces that that they've identified in Felino, Eck, Caprisa, Fiala, you know, potentially, right? Um, you know, that group of guys, and that they need to develop a Rossi, a Boldy, a Addison, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and those guys will be you know less expensive now, and you know what they have to, and yep. so I I think they're thinking, yeah, you know what. We've got our core. We've got to develop these younger guys and yep. get them up to speed, and then we'll be ready to do something. You're right, and and, you and Bill. Yep, I, I don't disagree with you. I think that Bill Guerin probably is thinking that he just, you know, doesn't want to come out and say it because he right. also wants Rossi and Durer and Duham and Boldy to know that they don't have. Okay. That even though there's that really glaring hole right now in the wild <laughs> lineup that is there for the taking, they yeah. don't want them to think like that's just going to be yeah. that they're going to be, you know, just anointed into that spot. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I like that he comes. He keeps them hungry coming to camp. You don't have to keep Marco Rossi hungry. That guy's, you know. Oh my god! Um, you know that that guy is, um, you know, has internal internal determination that you could just see why he's going to be a great hockey player. I yeah. Think. Well, Brandon and um, I talked to him. Brandon yeah. and I, you've talked to him quite a bit. We yep. talked to him last year, and you know, we wanted to, mm. you know, um, get back in the game and play alongside him. I mean, yeah. that's how that's how we. Yeah. Is. No, he's a he's a. That's why it was so sad to see what happened to him. Obviously, yeah. besides just the health issue, but this kid is, he, you know, he's he's got something in him that I think is going to drive him throughout a long NHL career. And um, and that's again why it's like, why trade? For, I don't know. I, yeah. I know I'm always the guy that kicks it down the curb, and you know, I'm always the guy that's like, they need a number one center, they need a number one center, and then when yeah. the number one center is there for the taking, I'm like, why are you going after that number one center? <laughs> yeah. um, but like I, I like they finally are drafting. Like that's the thing is that like they're finally drafting these centers. Like who's Nadina's a great player, yeah. Um, too, and they've and they drafted a couple other centers in this year's draft that I don't know anything about yet. But uh, but like 
I, I just think it would be such a shame to just throw a Marco Rossi in this deal or even a Matt Boldy, especially like if you know that right now, like you look at the wild salary structure and there's no way in the next two years that either one of Greenway or Dumba is going to be traded. Like one of them is going to be traded yeah. or done. Like you yeah. just figure it, you just look at it now. Like Financially. Start, now, it, you know, with the Parisian suitor buyout, it's easier to do the math on who could stay and who could go because there's also so many guys that are locked in now between Erickson Eck and Felino and Hartman. And right. not, that, not that those guys aren't tradable, but, you know, when Ryan Hartman takes a team friendly deal, you know that they're going to take care of him, right? Yeah. Um, but Brodeen and Spurgeon and same thing. So now it's like, all right, well, who isn't locked in? Dumbo Greenway. So, like, to me, wouldn't it be a shame to trade a Matt Boldy when I'm looking at Matt Boldy and saying he's your Greenway replacement? You know, mm -hmm. when I'm looking at Marco Rossi and saying, why do you have to go and give up all these assets for Jack Eichel when Rossi could be that guy in a couple of years? And if this team, like, the way I look at it is, is Jack Eichel in that five-year window that he has making $10 million a year, is, he gonna, is this team a cup contender with as limited and the squeeze that they've created themselves? I'd rather see... Rossi and Boldy grow with the team, then all of a sudden, maybe by year four, this team's good enough to win a cup, and Jack yeah. Eichel's with one year left on his deal. Like, I, I don't know. I, that's the way I would do it. Like, right. Like, when I hear right now the Wild are out, I hope they're legitimately out. But yep. it's just me. Uh, Michael, um, you know, we're 26 minutes into this. I have to ask you the obligatory Kaprizov contract question. Now, you filled in for myself and Common on Monday. I was unable to hear it. I was up in uh, Pat's yeah. neck of the woods up up in the iron range. So I did not hear the show, but I saw stuff on social media of that. You thought maybe if they had, a, if Capri stuff had a different agent, this thing would have been two months ago. Uh, is, is that accurate? Did you say that? And what, what was your thinking behind that? And, and how far apart are these? Two yeah. Sides? I mean, you know, I just think it's this agent driven. I think it's that there was anybody it, like, and the way, reason why I say that is that Kuro Capri stuff has given his agent carte blanche to run the show. And, you know, maybe at some point Kuro's going to have to come in and step in and say enough. Um, but I'm just saying, like, if Pat Brisson was his agent, if Dan Milstein was still his agent, if the guys at Octagon, if Newport, I guarantee this thing would be done by now. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Wild have offered a kid with 55 NHL games eight years times nine. Now, it, now, now, I'm not, I'm not, I am absolutely not saying that his agent isn't, like, I see what his agent is thinking here. You know, I mean, his agent's saying, well, as the cap continues to go up and there's less and there's no pandemic anymore, hopefully, um, you know, that eventually this guy, if he continues on his course, could be a 10 and a half, 11, 12 and a half million dollar player. But the cap is not going up in the next four years. If it is, it's going to be appreciably. You know, uh, Frank Saravelli just reported that next year the cap's going to be 82 and a half million and the cap will not go up a lot until the owners are paid back. They're, they're the money that they've essentially lost in terms of this, uh, this what the pandemic did to the game. So this cap is not going up. So he's not going to be a 10 and a half, 11 and a half, 12 and a half million dollar player, in my opinion, regardless. But either way, I get what his point is. But the fact that so far he's not willing to compromise on a four or five year deal, I just think is, is you know, says something. And so um, and, and the other thing is I don't blame the wild for not just wanting to give him settle and give him a three year deal because no, to me, yeah. he is absolutely laying his cards on the table here and the fact that he seems to have one foot out the door right now makes it like well then why should we make it easier for him because right. remember a three-year deal is a two-year deal because in two mm -hmm. years if he's not going to sign that extension in the summer of 2023 you're trading him you're trading. You have yep. Yep. so like and the, and also in that three-year interim it's gonna be us constantly writing uh he's got you know he's got they're gonna what do you do today you know, it's yeah. gonna be a constant 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 topic and yeah. so I would not settle if I'm Billy Garen. But it, it, there is going to come a point here where Billy, and maybe it's happened, where Billy says, look, four times eight, five times nine, whatever. And if he says no then, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, you might, you, you know, you either let him rot in Russia or you you, um, or you or just say, you know what, we're going to trade him now. Um, yep. And, um, you know, so it is, it, it, right now, it's, it's, it, they're, in, they're in a stalemate. Um, that could change at any time. Um, but I just... Uh, you know, I, I just, I just think that this is also making Kirill look really badly, and I hope, I hope he knows it. Like that's, that's to me my biggest concern is, is what is, what's being driven by him? Is stuff being lost in translation? Does he even, does he even know what the Wild have legitimately offered? Does he even know? Like, like, uh, like I just look at this as like, if I was Kirill, you know, I'd be like, you know what? I'm. They're offering me eight or nine million bucks right now. Take the deal. 
yeah. even if it's in a midterm deal, like four or five years. But like, do, do you really like you? He's twenty four. If you sign a five year deal, you're gonna you're gonna get your home run contract at twenty nine years old, a hundred percent. So you can make eight or nine million now on a four or five year deal. Why wouldn't you do that? You've just left this organization and this fan base waiting for you for five and a half years. Right. And then you show up and you get everybody in this market excited about what they finally have after 21 years in this organization. And, and it's not done yet. And I just think that's wrong. It's a wrong statement to make. Um, so, you know, if this continues to go sideways, this is one where I will absolutely uh, be the wild, uh, you know, apologist on this. Like this yeah. is not Bill Guerin's fault. Bill Guerin in March, Offered him after forty games, thirty-five, to be the richest player in franchise history, and this thing isn't done yet. So when I see wild fans like "Get it done, Billy!" like yeah, please, yeah. no, this is get it done, Kirill. And so, yeah. um, you know, that that's just my opinion. I'm sure it's not making it easier that I've been sort of outspoken in this. Um, you know, it certainly is not helping my relationship. I'm sure with his agent, um, who I've known for twenty, you know. Uh, 23 years, yeah. uh, 22, 24 years, probably. Um, you know, I, I dealt with him back. Uh, so the, he used to have a client, Valerie Kamensky and, um, and, uh, and David Namorowski and Kevin Weeks and, uh, and Igor Kravchuk. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've dealt with him a lot when I was in Florida. Um, uh, so Valerie Kamensky was a guy that the Panthers missed on that signed with the Rangers that, that uh, his agent put there. So I've known his agent for a long time. I've talked to his agent a ton. Um, and, you know, and I, I think he does great, great work for his client, obviously. Um, sorry to hit the camera there. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, I just think that there just comes a point where it's like, all right, you've made your point. Let's get this thing done. Let's move on. You're, you know, that's another thing that's really made this, this, this offseason, which I think is what's ticked off the organization. The fact that it took, that it's taken so long for what should have been an easy contract has absolutely put this team in a, in a hamstrung position all off season. And, um, and it's really a shame. This, 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 this should have been an easy thing for the wild. Right. Thing. And, um, and finally, you know, Billy Garrett said the heck with it. I'm just going to sign Eric and get that thing done. Um, and, uh, and he did that and now he's still fighting this out. And now, you know, we haven't even talked about Fiala, but now this has gotten ugly with Fiala. I mean, really well, ugly. Well, how far, how far apart are they with, with Fiala? They're really far apart, but, uh, you know, I think more so that I think that the Wild are going to have to figure out is that um, I've got, and I, you know, just from talking to people that know Fiala, but without talking to Fiala, so I don't want to put words in his mouth and I don't want to um, also say something that he'll probably publicly deny, but I am sure he is absolutely, like, stung, like, like, like punched in the gut that he has been treated so differently than, than, than Kirill Kaprizov. You know, I mean, you know, here's a guy that I think he feels that he lived, up to, he lived up to his bridge deal. He just saw Erickson Eck at 5.25. So the second the Wild did 5.25 for Erickson Eck, you know that up. Fiala is sitting back in Sweden thinking, and hmm. I say Sweden because that's where he lives. I know he's Swiss. I know yep. people are like, oh, yep. so doesn't know what he's now right. doing. But, you know, he's sitting back in Sweden saying, well, if, if they paid Erickson Eck 525, I know he's a great player and a complete player and all that, but I'm I'm the goal scorer. I'm the guy that brings – people come to watch me, not Erickson Eck, and that yep. is true. Yep. Um, so he's got to be thinking, well, I'm six and a half, seven $7 million player. And the Wild are obviously not thinking that. They're probably offering him between five, five, and 6. Um, you know, again, I'm guessing. Um, so, and then he sees that Kurprisa is being offered seven and eight year deals in the eight and $9 million range. And he's being offered five and a half in a, in a short term to midterm deal. And he's gotta be like, what is going on? And then to compound that, they bring him to arbitration, which tells him like, if I, they're saying to me, they don't care if I sign that two year deal and just walk straight to unrestricted free agency. So he's got to feel very unwanted right now. And, um, yeah. And that is something that, you know, I know sometimes Bill's just, Bill like is just like, well, you know, look, it's business, and it is. Um, but this is one thing they are going to have to, rep you know, and maybe they can in this interim because they are allowed. Um, they are allowed to, you know, continue to negotiate that contract as I look my email again um, to see if his arbitration hearing has been set. So they could set, they could continue to negotiate up until that ARB hearing. But to me, 
if they don't re-sign him at a you know four or five year deal, Billy is going to have to sit down with this kid and repair this relationship when he gets to camp. Because what? it's a, it is it's it's you know I I do feel for him. I I don't think I think there are a lot of warts in his game. I know he drives Dean nuts. I'm sure Dean drives him nuts. Yeah. Um, you know, I uh, defensively turnovers. This is stuff that that drives the coaching staff and management. I'm sure crazy, um, but you know, there's there's no crime in having two great players on your team. All right, let me. <laughs> and let me, let me. Uh, you know, Fiala and Kaprizov are something you can build around, and and um, and this has definitely gotten you know this has gotten a tough part. And then they're going to sign him. You know, I get it now. I mean, they're going to sign him at one or two years, and then probably the five and five and a half to six million dollar range uh, if an arb arbitrator gets involved, and that's going to be good cost control for the team but it doesn't mean that that hasn't just written the the you know outgoing paper for kevin fiala eventually in the next two years okay that being said um you know as well as i do sometimes we overvalue our own players mm -hmm. um what would be the market for a guy like kevin fiala if it got to a point of you know what we got to move him yeah, uh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, he is probably the type of guy that you could um, use to get a center um, or he's the type of guy. Um, somebody brought this up to me the other day. Could you make a three way trade with with Eichel, or excuse me, for Eichel, where maybe Buffalo is saying we don't want Fiala, but maybe you get another team that is willing to take Fiala and give, you know, and you exchange a bunch of assets that right, way. Right. Um, that is a way. Um, like, I, I do think that um, that that's a possibility as well. Um, so, um, and in terms of his market value, I mean, look, Kevin's not a $7 million hockey player. Um, his market right now is in the range that the Wild are offering this deal to. Mm. Um, in two years when he's an unrestricted free agent, our analytics uh, guy, Dom, projects him to be a $6.75 million player. Um, but that's the market value. That's not, that's, you know, not the, what would be considered the cap hit. So yep. um, right now the wilds are offering him in range. I've got one. I've got a, another one. Um, Anaheim, from what I've read, has floated the possibility of trying to move Ryan Kessler's contract. Okay. Uh, Cause he's LTIR not going to play. Is that something that the Wild could do? Um, you know, not. I'm not saying it's Fiala involved, but could they take on a contract like that, like Tampa just did with the Seabrook deal? Yep. Yeah, I mean, does that help them at all or not? I think that in the next four years, and that is something that I haven't pointed out, that that is something the Wild are going to have to start playing that game uh, for. Now, Kessler, I'm just looking right now, makes $6.875 million. Again, you don't necessarily have to do that unless the Wild want to spend over that money, and that's for us for one year. So, you know, to me, it still doesn't create the – to me, that's a temporary – um, okay. thing, but it's something that you're going to have to continue to maybe do. Um, 6.675. I don't know how, it, you know, I don't know if insurance would pay that, um, how that all works. Um, you know, I don't think that after you just bought out Parisian Suter that, that, um, that, uh, you know, Craig Leopold would be loving the fact that it's like here, pay 6.675 million to somebody that's not going to play. I haven't investigated that thing, but okay. to me, that is what you just brought up, Pat, is something that the wild will be able to do in the next three or four years to gain extra cap space. And they might have to do it when the squeeze is really on. I don't know if Kessler makes sense now, unless you're going to make a big trade. But again, once that Kessler contract comes off the books would be, which would be this year, then it doesn't help you get like a Jack Eichel. Yeah. But if you need that six, six, seven, five to spend over the cap this year, it would um, right now, the wild have uh, actually still plenty of cap space. So I don't think that's something they need to do now, but what you just brought up is something that I think the wild are going to have to start to do in years two, three, and four, the Parisi suitor buyouts to get that extra cap space. It's something that they're going to have to do. It will cost them assets to do it because every team in the league know, like, right. you know, it's funny because you're helping the other team, but you're the team that's probably going to have to give up assets because everybody knows what you're trying to do where Arizona does this now, but they're getting the assets to take the yeah. bad contract where the wild, it's going to be the opposite. They're going to be the ones taking the contract, but giving up the asset, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. And we just saw that with Tampa. You're right. I mean, right. there's multiple ways to do it. Um, the reason why I'm so uneducated when it comes to that is the wild have never done that. Obviously, since I've yeah. been covering the team, they've never right. been in that position. So um, the one thing I will investigate that you just brought up is, um, you know, I've, 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 is that, 
you know, Kessler, it's a $6.675 million cap hit that would allow you to spend over the cap. But uh, who pays that actual money? Does right. insurance pick it up? Um, is it is it paid off at this point because he's essentially retired? That's the type of stuff that I'm going to have to figure out because because I do think it makes a difference when you're already spending 81 million dollars like um, Parisi like uh, like Craig Leopold is on the payroll and you've just essentially given 6.7 million dollars each over spread over eight years to um, Parisi and Suter. You know, are you going to be really enthused that hey, by the way, because we did that. Um, we need to start taking dead money back to be able to fill out a payroll. That's the type of conversation that a GM can have an owner that can be quite uncomfortable. Um, but it's very different if Craig Leopold knows that I'm not paying a cent for that contract, that insurance is paying out, maybe even if it's 70% or whatever it is. Um, so that's the type of thing that I'll have to uh, talk to my more experienced Tampa Bay writers and my Arizona writers to figure out how, how does it all work. Um, so They'll like, be mentoring yeah. you on that one. Yeah, uh, Michael, as always. It is, I will say Wild fans ask me all the time about LTIR, and it's it's. I'm always really vague about it because I've never had to deal with it. You know, really? like I've never, you know, the Wild went into LTIR a couple times this year that allowed them to, you know, deal with their payroll during the pandemic, but it was not, uh, you know, it wasn't something, it's, some, it's not something that I've read every line of the CBA about, that's for sure. Uh, Michael, really appreciate your time as always. You're the best, and I can't wait to read your story on Kevin Fiala's arbitration date tonight on The yeah. Athletic. All right, see ya. Thanks, Take care, guys. Thanks, Michael. Care. Right. Michael Russo from The Athletic. Pat, before we uh, spend a couple minutes to wrap up, I just wanted to let our uh, listeners and viewers know uh, that you should go to sodastick.com to get your original Minnesota sports-inspired goods. If you haven't seen this stuff yet, you got to check it out. One of my favorite designs is the uh, Paul Bunyan lumber Lumberjack with the hockey stick which I'm wearing right now. All of their apparel is screen printed here in Minnesota on super soft, super comfy shirts. You will love it. And uh, we're going to hook you up with 15% off your next order. So use the code KFAN for 15% off. That is sodastick.com, original Minnesota sports inspired goods. Use the code KFAN for 15% off your next order. Pat, we chatted playing Minnesota a while. I just wanted to get one one or two topics before we go here. Okay. Uh, uh, college hockey. We haven't talked a lot of college hockey in the last couple of weeks, but I saw that uh, Andy Murray resigned after 10 years as head coach at Western Michigan. Um, it's kind of a bizarre resigning because it didn't really say that he was done. It didn't say he was retiring. Yeah, it didn't really give a lot of reasons as to why he was resigning. What's what's going on there for that uh, NCHC school? Well, first of all, a uh, a Andy Murray is a brilliant hockey mind. I, I, it, you know, I, um, I've had the uh, luxury of having to deal with him over the past six, seven years. Um, and... I tell you what, every time I talk to him, I learn something more about the game, uh, philosophy wise, uh, you know, all of that stuff. Um, I just think, you know, quite frankly, I don't think Andy's ready to retire. Uh, from what I'm hearing from different people is that um, their new head coach, Pat Fershweiler, uh, who was a Western Michigan grad, coached uh, with the Detroit Red Wings and in the and uh, also in the American League and other leagues. Um he was the associate head coach. Apparently, there were feelers out on the East Coast. Um, I, I'm not sure if it was UMass or somewhere else where they wanted to bring him on board. And and I think at that point, um, Andy said, "You know, uh, you know, I you know I don't have a lot of years left, so uh, I'm going to let Pat take over." And, that makes uh, sense. And we, yep. and we don't and we don't want to lose Pat here at Western and. You know, and uh, and so I think that had something to do with it. Not 100 percent, but, you know, the people that seem to be in the know uh, regarding that program um, have intimated that to me. So, you know, good for Andy. I, you know, he's going to end up with an NHL team or 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 something because, uh, you know, he, he keeps in great shape. He loves the game. He loves teaching. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm sure he'll stay in it somehow. Can you explain to me what's going on with the New York Islanders? Because Zach Parisi is basically everyone's guaranteeing he's going to go there, but hasn't signed officially. Yeah. Uh, Kyle Palmieri, who could get quite the sum on the free agent market, obviously is going there, but the contract has not been made official yet. I know there are some that are speculating that he's trying to make it vague on how much cap space they're going to have for yeah. trade purposes. Like maybe they want to go get Vladimir Tarasenko. Right. Is that, what, is that what's going on there? Because it's just, it's just bizarre to have all these players – that uh, haven't officially re-signed, you know, though it's expected they're going to go there. 
Yeah, well, Lula Amarillo is um, unlike any other general manager in the league. Um, uh, you cannot have any facial hair. You have to. He almost runs it like the New York Yankees, right? And how they expect their players to act, behave, you know, all those protocols. Um, and he also doesn't like people knowing what he's doing. Um, but there have been uh, a myriad of rumors that uh, Tarasenko and the Islanders are have been trying to work out a deal. Um, the St. Louis Blues wanted Dobson, their highly regarded defenseman. Islanders aren't going to give up that young defenseman. Uh, uh, Lamarillo did trade uh, Nick Letty, right? And got yep. 5.5 million off the books there. So what I think, I, I really do think that they are trying to, to get Tarasenko and, uh, and, you know, and, and that's why I don't think we've heard Zach Parisi's name um, announced yet as a member of the New York Islanders, because they don't know what their cap is going to be or what their, you know, what their, um, uh, how much cash they're going to have left. So I, you know, I, I think, uh, I think they're trying to make a deal. Um, I think they, they think Tarasenko is a guy that can, you know, help get them one rung higher and, and that's to the cup. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Thank you, Pat. As always, we will talk to you next week on beyond the pod. Have a great week, Brandon. Thank right, you. Thanks. He's Pat Michelletti. I'm Brandon Molesky. Thank you so much for either watching on our KFN YouTube channel or listening to uh, on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcast. We appreciate it. As always, remember, go to sodasick.com. Use the code KFN for 15% off. We appreciate them uh, backing this podcast. We will talk to you next week. Oh, thanks to Michael Russo as well for joining. We'll talk to you next week right here on Beyond the Pod. Bye.